So I'll just share my slide here. So first of all, a brief, a brief introduction. So I've spent more than 20 years of my life in healthcare internationally in a range of operational and investment roles. Uh, today, I advise investors, including IFC, on investing in private healthcare companies around the world. Uh, so I would like to start my presentation today with a question and a proposition. And my question to everybody here today is, how confident are you that you understand the levels of efficiency and performance and quality across your organizations? So I spent, let's move to the next slide. There we go. Uh, I spent more than 10 years of my own life uh, in health in the area of healthcare performance improvement. And this mostly involved working with healthcare organizations, mostly hospitals, uh, which were in a distressed kind of situation. And that usually meant that they were running out of cash and in danger of going bankrupt and into uh, non-existence. And sometimes I would be sent to uh, a new city or even a country that I had never visited before and be faced with a very large hospital of several hundred beds uh, where the, the owners were stressed, the management team was stressed, usually the employees were stressed, and we were in a situation where we had to make very important things very quickly. Um, and the reason I chose this slide is that often I felt like the poor chap in this slide where I was looking out at this vast complicated hospital and wondering where to start. Uh, so were the problems, for example, in a particular staff group like nursing staff or medical staff, you know, too many staff or too few or salaries too high? Or was it in a particular department like radiology or laboratory or operating rooms? Um, or did it relate to, for example, uh, supply chain issues um, like, like drug procurement? Um, and, uh, you know, some, sometimes we were faced actually where instead of trying to make the right decision, we were actually trying to make the, the least wrong decision. And it was during this time that I developed a proposition. And my proposition is that with good quality benchmarking, hospitals can avoid going into that situation in the first place where you have to make these rapid emergency type decisions. And secondly, that if you do find yourself in this situation, for example, in the middle of a recession or COVID or what have you, that at least you're prepared and that you know where to focus your efforts. So I'll move on to what we did as part of IFC's healthcare benchmarking pilot, uh, who was involved. And, and the main part of my presentation is actually, what did we discover? Uh, so it might be useful just to give a little bit of background on how, you know, how did we get here? Um, over, over the years, several healthcare organizations, you know, all, all working in developing countries, uh, approached IFC to set up, set up a benchmarking service. Um, and, and, and reasons included, you know, that there's, you know, they felt like there's almost like a cloak of secrecy in many countries around um, sharing data. And secondly, that if you can get data, and sometimes it's just informally, uh, the, the quality of that data is often very, not very good or not, not very comprehensive, um, or it's not comparing like with like. So to cut a very long story short, uh, we, we went out and we canvassed with, with many of these companies. Uh, and we, we asked questions like, you know, why do you want to do benchmarking? What are your priority issues? Um, you know, what, you know what, what, are you, what, what are your objectives through, through this thing? Um, and as, as you can imagine, we got a lot of different answers, a lot of different priorities, a lot of different ideas about why to do it. But again, just to cut the long story short, um, we assembled 18 companies and the thing, the thing all 18 had in common was that, first of all, they were all hospitals. Uh, so we weren't talking about primary care organizations here. 
Uh, but more importantly, they shared a vision that they all wanted to develop a benchmarking service. They all wanted, they were, they were all willing to share their data with other organizations on a confidential basis, but still share it uh, and contribute to it and contribute to the effort that was involved in setting up the, the service itself. Um, so these, these 18 companies, uh, like I say, all hospital companies, all working in emerging markets and quite a representative sample across geographies you can see here. So they represent the IFC geographies, uh, mostly South Asia, also big representation from the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa with contributions from Latin America, the Pacific region and from Europe as well. Um, and just to tell you a little bit more is that, you know, if we look at the profile of these companies, like I say, 18 companies, 48 different hospitals, um, you know, we were looking at a range from quite, quite small organizations, and by that I mean, say, around 50 hospitals, right through to um, groups, uh, where, you know, that ran five or more hospitals um, with, within quite a corporate structure. So different levels of, of maturity there as well. But like I say, the, the common aim was to develop a benchmarking service that would be useful to all. And to cut another long, very long story short, uh, what we arrived at was 150, sorry, 185 metrics uh, that, we, that we gathered across the areas of financial performance, operational performance, quality, and surgery. So financial was, as, as it shows here, you know, the revenue profile, profitability, return on assets, and so on. Operational, we looked at staffing ratios and key asset utilization, such as CT scanning or um, cath lab, or radiotherapy, diagnostic, and so on. Uh, we chose 19 quality indicators. And for surgery, we looked at 18 common procedures, uh, specifically around day case surgery. We spent a lot of time uh, agreeing on these indicators more importantly, agreeing on the definitions, because a big challenge was comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges, not only between countries, but even within countries, e even something like a bed, a hospital bed. You know, we had to agree, for example, does a bed include an observation bed, a dialysis bed, a baby cot? a neonatal intensive care bed, chemotherapy couch, and, and the list goes on. So a lot of work around that to make sure that as closely as possible, we compared like with, with like. And what, what, what did these companies get, get in return for, for all the effort that they made in participating in this lengthy process and submitting their data? Uh, we provided all with a spreadsheet of all of the data that, that we uh, that we assembled everything except the name of each organization and we complemented that with other or with other data that we find from different sources uh, a tableau that they could in interpret themselves and a powerpoint uh, presentation for each one individually highlighting how they performed compared with the other organizations um, before i move on to the actual findings i think it'll be interesting for people to know what data these 48 hospitals were actually uh, providing. Um, and we can see here that in the areas of finance and operations, we got more than 72% of the data that we asked for. So that was, a, that was a very high level of data, particularly when you think that some of the data was not, not applicable. So it would never be 100% because you know, for example, not everybody does radiotherapy or not everybody has an MRI scanner. Um, but the level of completeness was much lower when we look at quality and surgical data. And I guess um, for, for me and maybe for many of you looking at this chart, it presents something of a challenge because throughout my life, you know, I've always said and I've always gone to hospitals that have said, you know, things like, Quality is our mission. Quality is what drives us. Quality is at the core of our, you know, whatever. But when we look at the data actually being collected, it's mostly around the financial performance and the operational performance and less around 
uh, quality and clinical performance. So like I say, I guess, I guess there's something challenging in that for, for many of us looking at this. And, and just a final point on the data, you know, if, if we're thinking about correlations between the data, and that is one thing that we noticed is that organizations that were good at providing quality data also provided very good data in the other areas, including finance. But the reverse was not necessarily true. So the organizations that provided very good financial data were not necessarily uh, very good with providing a lot of quality data. So maybe, maybe that's something that we'll come back to, to later. So I'll, mo I'll move on now to what did we actually find? What were the actual results uh, of the work? And I'll start with the financial data. So here's a chart where we plotted out on this chart the 48 hospitals EBITDA margin. So for anyone with a non-financial background, EBITDA is earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. It's a very long word, but put simply, it's, it's profit. And uh, it's, um, it's a very basic financial, financial indicator. And here we see the profit level of the 48 hospitals uh, in, marked in blue. Now, the names have been removed in the chart that every uh, member got, uh, we, would, we highlighted where, where they fell on this chart. And the gray bars are publicly listed healthcare companies, uh, 105 of them, in fact. So here on this chart, we've got about 150 bars. And we can see that the healthcare companies in our, in our club uh, more or less mirror uh, their performance of publicly listed companies. But we can also see that there's a very wide range of profitability, you know, ranging from over 25% right down to the minus figures. Uh, it's true to say that some of those in the minus are startup hospitals and ones that haven't reached profitability yet. Um, but I guess uh, a theme running through all of the slides that I'm showing you is that many of these hospitals operate in very similar markets with very similar patients and very similar business models, but yet have a very different performance on the charts, either over on the right or over on the left. And th this, this, this is where benchmarking becomes very interesting in that wondering why is that when everything looks the same, why is there such a big level of difference? And we see a similar here with return on assets, which again is a very common, commonly used financial metric. We see a very wide spread across both IFC club members in blue and the gray publicly listed companies. And these publicly listed companies are mostly, I would say, in let's say developed markets, but at least 10, 15 percent are in are in emerging markets. So mo moving on to uh, the revenue from uh, from self-pay as a, as a proportion of, of total revenue. And here we can see, looking, this is just the IFC members now, the 48 hospitals, we see a very wide range here from close to 100% cash and close to 0% cash, uh, which, which would be markets that have a very high level of, of private medical insurance. Um, if we look now at the average price, we did quite, quite a bit of benchmarking on pricing levels. Um, here is the price of a normal delivery package. We can see all, almost three different uh, groups here. Uh, th those that charge up to $500, those that are between $500 and $1,500, and those above. So it's quite, it's, again, it's quite interesting that for, for the same service, uh, which is a, a normal delivery, and this is a package, so it includes everything, and yet we have very different prices across emerging markets for that service. Uh, again, this is, this is a very popular um, measure, which is particularly used in Asia, which is average revenue per, per occupied bed day. And again, we can see, you know, if we, if we, if we remove the outliers on the right, uh, which, which are very large outpatient practices, actually, we, we, can, we can say, I think, two, two very distinct groups here. 
uh, one which is generating less than a thousand dollars per per bed day, and the other which is you know more than two thousand. So very different groups. And again, we might like to think that all of those on the left are operating in like low income market markets, serving low income patients, and and the opposite is true on the right. And there's some truth in that, but it's not it's not the whole truth. And if I move on now to operational benchmarks, and like I said, we, we gathered data for 185, so I'm just showing you a sample here. Uh, here's the number of inpatients per available bed. And any of you who work in healthcare operations will know that this is a function of bed occupancy and length of stay. And again, we can see three or four quite distinct groups here marked out by low, low throughput per bed, you know, so let's say around 30 patients per bed, right up to on the right there, uh, you know, move, moving on to about, uh, you know, 100, 100 patients uh, per bed per year. Um, now, I, I can tell you that, you know, when I'm advising investors and we look at business plans, we usually see a number of around about 70 patients per bed per year as a projection. And that, that equates to 65% occupancy, length of stay, three to four beds, which you would think is not particularly aggressive. But, but when we actually look at this, you know, this sample of, of, of almost 50 hospitals, we can see that actually not, not so many achieve that level of, of 70 patients per bed per year. Um, now, I'll show you some similar charts to this, but maybe before I do so, um, you know, some, sometimes when I chart, show charts like this, I can see people looking at me like thinking, oh, this is like an investor financial guy who's just interested in the numbers. Um, but if we, if we think again about, well, who, who really pays for inefficient use of beds or inefficient use of any healthcare asset? Uh, for sure, investors do. Um, but the people who really pay for low efficiency in hospitals are patients uh, because they pay through higher prices uh, because hospital assets are very expensive. And if the utilization is very low, then the people who end up paying are the patients and staff will pay through lower wages. And of course, investors usually pay through, through lower returns. Um, so this is number of dialysis uh, patients per bed. And one of the reasons I chose this was that, you know, again, those of you who work, work in the dialysis sector will know that patients are, are fa fairly standard, let's say, uh, to, to just be very, um, to make a very general statement. Um, so we, we would expect that, you know, this would be quite a flat chart when we look at the number of dialysis sessions per year. But yet we see a very wide spread of, uh, in terms of utilization of assets. And again, dialysis machines are very expensive to buy, very expensive to run. Um, so if they're running at a very low level of utilization, that will inevitably mean uh, higher charges for the patients that are, that are using them. Again, looking at number of surgical cases per, per operating theater, uh, we might like to think that those on the left-hand side are doing very complex work and those on the right-hand side with high light levels of utilization are doing very routine work. And again, there, there, there is some truth in that, but there, there are also very wide, unexplained differences between these. Some, some of these hospitals on the left and right of this chart are actually doing very similar uh, surgical caseload or what, what looks like it. And yet we see very wide uh, variations between them. Um, this is the number of scans per CT scanner, CT scanning and MRI scanning, of course, very, very expensive um, to, to, to own, to buy and to operate, and yet very wide levels of, of utilization across, across them all. Um, this is the total number of staff per bed. And actually, if we, if we remove the outliers on the right, um, Actually, I would say there was less variation here. You know, we, see, we can see that most hospitals seem to employ somewhere be, between four and seven staff per bed. Uh, so, so yes, there, there is a variation, but maybe, maybe not quite as much as, as we expected. 
here. Um, on this slide, I thought, I thought I should show this because this is an issue that I know unites hospitals and healthcare organizations around the whole world. And it is staff, annual staff turnover, staff turnover. Um, you know, it's, it's something that every healthcare company in the whole world, or else public and private, uh, worry about. Uh, and here we can here we can see on our chart. I think I think we can see three different groups here, separate groups. So we, we've got you know about a third a third of the of the members of staff turnover of you know five five or six percent or less. Uh, and then we have about a third between ten and twenty percent, and then about a third twenty percent or more. And I guess if I was if I was a member of this club and I was in the group that was twenty percent or more. I would be. I would like to talk to the people on the left-hand side of the group uh, that had much lower levels, um, you know, and, and wonder like, is it just about salary, or are they doing things that that we haven't thought about, um, you know? Because again, ev I think everybody who's uh, who's watching and listening today will appreciate that this is a really important issue uh, for healthcare companies everywhere, and and nobody really gains out of it. Uh, so, so you know, having a conducive work environment, a work environment where the workforce is stable, works as a team, where we don't have this level of turnover, would be a good thing for for everybody. Uh, so, I'll move on now to quality, uh, which I know is 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 of interest to to many people um, watching today. And we we collected data on nineteen very carefully chosen quality metrics uh, and again i think everyone who works in quality will appreciate how difficult it was to agree on the definitions for this um, and I'm, I'm just going to show two two metrics because actually the charts look very similar for for most of them um, and, and this is the the healthcare associated uh, infection rate uh, which will be a rate that uh, that most of you will be familiar with, I think. I guess the first thing to notice here is how many zeros or blanks we just didn't get. Um, so considering that, you know, these 48 hospitals are mostly quite mature uh, organizations, you know, quite well developed, uh, that about half of them, you know, either reported zero or nothing at all, um, so, you know, says something in itself or, or asks a question at least, I guess the other the other question, I guess, that comes out of it, and Julia, you said at the beginning that maybe we'll get answers, but I think maybe we'll get more questions than answers. And the question I would ask is, you know, if we look at the, the hospitals on the right, and you know, of course the data is anonymized, but if we look at this, the hospitals on the right, do they really have a higher um, you know, infection rate or are they just much better at monitoring and recording it? I think that's the real question here. So is it that they have a worse infection rate, so much worse, or just much better at, at measuring it? And I'm sure people on the call will have a, a view on that. And the other chart I'd like to show is, is on incidents, uh, reported incidents per bed, which is an area that I'm, I myself am a big supporter of. Um, and again, we see a, a very big, difference in the number of incidents reported. And my question would be the same, which is the, 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 ones, the ones on the right here, do they really have a much higher level of, of incidents happening or are they much better at reporting their incidents? Uh, so I, I'll leave that question, but I'll make one more com one other comment on incident reporting. And that is, if you go back to the very beginning of my presentation and I showed the level of completeness of data, there was a very clear correlation between the companies that did any incident reporting and their level of completion. So companies that were able to provide any data on incident reporting had the most complete data set overall, most complete financial reporting, most complete operational reporting, and most complete clinical reporting if they were able to provide number of incidents. So incident reporting seems to be a key indicator of the level of maturity 
of, of, a, of a management information system at the very least. And the final, the final area that we looked at was uh, surgical day case rates. Um, and we chose 18 common surgeries uh, where there was a view that there was a big potential to improve the, the, uh, the day case rate. And here, I'll, ju I'll just show th this one and then show a macro picture of the others. So this is a, a, a lap coli, which again, you know, many of you with a, with a clinical background uh, will know is a very common surgical procedure and also commonly done uh, as a day case. Uh, so we've, again, I, I would just point out that not so many, not so many of the members um, provided data on this, either because they don't do lap coli or they don't record it as a day case. Um, the gray charts are the UK day case rates, uh, the bottom quartile, the median, and the upper quartile. That's what those three gray charts are. And we can see that be, and the reason we chose the UK is that we were able to get good data from the UK. It was, wasn't, we're not selling, selling the UK or anything like that. We just got good data from there. Uh, so we, we can see that most of the organizations in our benchmarking club uh, actually don't reach the lowest quartile of the UK, uh, which is about 60% done as, as, as a day case surgery. And if, if we look at the macro picture here, what we see here, I've, I've plotted for all of the 18 um, day case surgical procedures that we looked at. In blue is the UK median, and in red is the median for the 48 hospitals in the benchmarking club. And we can see here that there's a very wide difference between the two. And, and I guess this was, Maybe people on, on the line um, have a different view. But I guess for me, even though I've worked you know, quite a lot around the world, I was surprised just how big this difference was. Um, you know, I, you know I, would, I wouldn't particularly say the UK is a gold standard. Um, Tim can, can, talk, can, can say later, but I think the US is much more developed than, than here in the UK. Uh, but still, there's a very big difference in, in day case rates. Um, between what the UK is achieving at its median level and the hospitals in our benchmarking club. And that, that would appear to me to be a big area for performance improvement. And I know there are some, some challenges, of course, um, around this in, 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 in certain markets, but it does seem to be a particularly wide um, variation here. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish there on the benchmarking. But one thing I just wanted to say before finishing is that uh, you know, this, this benchmarking service that IFC has launched, um, you know, it's, it's very pioneering service. It's a, it's a very important service to IFC, uh, but it, it also fits alongside the other service, some of the other services that IFC provides in healthcare, uh, specifically EPIC, which is the ethical principles in healthcare, which is um, you know, ethical standards and a group uh, that, that, that aim to promote ethical standards in healthcare, specifically in emerging markets. Health IQ, which is I, IFC's, again, very important service aimed at raising quality standards in healthcare, which is part of this entire, uh, this web, webinar services. And, and, and IFC, of course, provides uh, tailored financing as well. So that's just to say that the benchmarking fits, fits along with those. And finally, I'll just say that, you know, this, this was a team effort, um, not, it was a team effort with the 18 companies who very generously uh, provided their time to make it, I, I think, quite a successful initiative because it was a big risk that we all took at the very beginning, uh, but also a, a team effort within IFC, particularly with the, the six people on this slide here with their, with their contact details. So I'll stop there and say thank you very much to everyone for, for their attention and for joining the, the webinar today. Thanks a lot, Emmett. Lots of interesting insights, uh, very interesting information generally, I must say, because, you know, personally, when I was working in a big hospital chain in Russia, I was always curious to know what is the bad occupancy rate, 
what is the staff turnover rate in other hospitals, in the hospitals that are nearby, in the hospitals which are in other cities uh, in Russia. I wanted to compare my own work in quality department to uh, lots of parameters. Uh, and it was so difficult to find this information, unfortunately, because not, not everyone is publishing this data. So I think this was such an exciting effort, such an interesting eye-opening exercise. And now we are moving to our panel discussion. Uh, personally, I'm very excited today because we have, as I said earlier, extended a uh, group of experts today. So we have three hospitals and we have also IFC team representatives. So I will start with the hospital experts from all around the world. So we have uh, today, Dr. Eli Kem Tamaklo from uh, Niaho Hospital, Managing Director. We have Edward Lotz, uh, Chief of Operating and clinical officer from Abdali Hospital. And also we have Professor Timothy Morgenthaler, Vice Chairman, Quality and Affordability from Mayo Clinic. From IFC team, we have Raju Narayan. Uh, many of you maybe already uh, know Raju, met or somehow got acquainted with him. And of course, we have Charles Dalton. That's apart from Emmett Moriarty, whom you already met, who was already making a presentation. So now we are going to discuss lots of different questions, lots of interesting issues which relate to benchmarking. And the first question is uh, actually, why is international benchmarking uh, important? Why, why, why should we bother? That's the question. And that is the question to Edward Lotz, but all our other panelists are welcome to comment on this. So Edward, you're welcome. Thank you, Julia, and, and welcome to everybody. And thank you, Emmett, for that um, presentation. And also a big thank you to the IFC for doing this immense, valuable and insightful piece of work and leading on it. I think the usefulness of benchmarking has been very much already kind of echoed by both Emmett and, and yourselves, and, and that it drives um, performance and that it also um, tests uh, very much assumptions around very big questions that you've got. For example, um, is the assumptions in my business plan realistic in terms of pricing, et cetera. But I think the salient kind of benefits that we have experienced is, 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 is you've got that all this data and it promotes a culture of a learning organization. Because in the end, all this data, and as Emmett has, has, uh, has, has demonstrated, these are all pointers. These are all still just measurements. But what lies behind that? And that is where we have find it very useful to then go, and go into a deeper delve in, in our own organization. How is it come that we are producing these numbers? And we discovered in things like when we have shared this data and received it, that you discover problems that you didn't know about. And you discover problems that you thought was problems that is actually not a problem in terms of. And all organizations has only got so much limited management and data resources. You cannot tackle all of the problems and all of the issues. So it also helps prioritize in terms of effectiveness and efficiencies, what parameters. But the learning organization aspect, where you then go down, you analyze how your own organization is doing, how your own organization is, and, and clarify, clarify these number. And that for us has been one of the most useful um, points because by its very nature, people in organizations is competitive. They want to be the best in, in, in all of the parameters. So you, you really go and look in detail every little step of your, your organization that you, you, you can improve. And then also it goes without saying that no benchmarking exercise or if you compare your, yourself, if you are not absolutely confident in the quality of your data, that, that they then uh, um, um, you, you have to first address the challenge of, of getting your quality of your data right. And the quality of the data then drives, come back to the one biggest 
improvement or the one biggest benefit which we demonstrated through benchmarking is it drives your performance. And that is in the end what we as organizations um, all strive for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Edward. This was very helpful. Uh, so I also wanted to ask Charles and Raju to go in and comment a little bit before we ask the panelists, the guest panelists from hospitals uh, to also give their input on this. Thank you, Julia. I, I can go first. As, as we heard today, uh, you know, benchmarking is, is not just about uh, measuring something at that moment and, and then trying to react to that because what we are trying to find out as an organization, as an healthcare operator or an administrator is, is there a systemic issue in my, within my organization? Is this the trend or is this, uh, is this a process related characteristics or is it just a one-off event? So in order to do that, you know, if you look at the trend, there's two ways of looking at the trend, right? One is trend over time and the other one is trend among the peers. So the trend over time obviously is going to take time because if you are the only organization and if you only have your data, if you are a single facility uh, hospital, you need to wait until uh, next year when you measure the same uh, indicator and whether it is repeating itself, getting better, getting worse before you can take action or significant uh, corrective measures. And that is okay, but the problem is at the same time, you are treating patients. So it's like changing the tires of a moving car. You need to be agile and you need to be dynamic in, in your decision making. So that's where benchmarking among the peers, looking at the trend among peers of similar organizations, similar maturities, similar operating environment, that comes in comes in very handy. So at least you know that you are not alone. As, as I mentioned, you know, uh, is it a problem just for me or is it everybody within my space having a similar issue, then there is, I know that I need to do some corrective action. So I think that's what this exercise was trying to do. And I think as an operator who come from hospital operations background, I find it extremely useful and, and uh, important to that. And as we all know, again, we are trying to do is an apple to apple comparison. It's not perfect, of course, at least it could be green apple versus red apple, but at least it's an apple. So I think that is, that's where the standardization of definitions and everything comes in handy. And I think as the last point I would like to make is benchmarking, don't assume that it's going to give you all the answers to your, your issues. I think what it helps you to do is to create that behavior within the organization to ask the right questions. And I think that is more important than having all the answers. With that, I will pass it to Charles. Yeah, just quickly, thanks, Raju, and thanks, Emma, for the excellent presentation. I, I, I just really emphasise a couple of the points that sort of I've taken away from this. The important thing, and I think Emmett sort of highlighted in his presentation, that benchmarking is, don't see benchmarking as a league table. There are multiple variable reasons why you might be performing where you are, and that most of them will could be completely valid. So it's using that data to ask questions of yourselves how could we do things differently? What works? What doesn't work? What is driving this particular trend? So I think that's the that's the key thing with it with with this type of with this type of exercise that you can ask yourself questions. I think the other point I'd like to make, and this is really also based on what we see when we do our due diligence work and we we meet sponsors of hospitals in multiple countries, it's. You've got to understand your business from multiple perspectives. And quite often we see a lot of focus on revenue and that isn't the right way to go manage your business. You need to understand revenue, cost, productivity. You need to understand your business model. You also need to understand the multiple variables within that business model from a, from a clinical perspective, who's paying for your services, how are you going to source equipment? How are you going to utilize? And that's where this benchmarking can help you understand the questions you should be asking for yourself to then operate your business uh, uh, appropriately. So I'll, I'll stop there because I know Julia is going to be asking other questions. We'll, we'll bring out some of this detail. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Charles. Very useful advice, both from Charles and Raju. So basically, yeah, benchmarking gives you a lot of information and makes you change your mind about lots of things. So I would say in what, if we want to sum it up in one sentence, it's definitely life-changing to compare yourself to others. But be careful, use the same data. Otherwise, you are comparing apples to oranges and it may drive you up the wrong track. 
Okay, so once the exercise of benchmarking is done, so you collect the data, you compare the data, like you join some benchmarking club, could be IFC club or some other club, you uh, compared yourself, got the report, what can you use this data for? And what conclusions can you make? This is our second question for the panel. And this is a question to Dr. Elikem. Dr. Elikem, you're welcome. Thank you very much, um, Julia, and thanks, Emmett, for the presentation and the IFC team. I think for us as an organization, we were very willing to join this exercise because we, for a long time, had a lack of data, especially working in Ghana and Sub-Saharan Sub Africa. You don't necessarily get a lot of comparators. Having the, geogra the geographic expression of the data was helpful because you could get some insights as to what's common in the sub-Saharan region, but also compared to the sub Southeast East, um, Asia um, and get the insights. I, I can say that we really appreciated the IFC team um, having sessions to look at our performance in comparison to the benchmark and together kind of get insights as to our performance. So I think that in terms of its use from a performance improvement perspective, that was a useful insight to help us improve. The second thing is that we are a growing company. We've been in existence for more than 50 years, but the assumptions and the reasoning and interpretation has changed over time and continues to change. So especially in a post COVID or um, in a world that um, is looking at infectious diseases, when we start to look at what decisions around where to invest in, which areas to amplify. And when we start to look at sustainability, because for, for, for profit organization, um, it's absolutely important that we are sustainable in the long term. I think that the decisions, um, especially for our capital raise and our business planning, um, the, the insights from this helped us to validate assumptions. What was interesting for us was there was a validation of the number of assumptions that we had that told us that we were on the right track. But there were also others which we didn't realize had a strong correlation. So an example is full-time employees versus part-time and versus contract. We have um, had to deal with the impact of the brain drain where you have a lot of doctors who've trained outside or who've gone outside. So you don't have a lot of specialists in the country. And so there's a dependence for certain specialties to work with contract specialists. But then when we started looking at our growth, employing these specialists, can be quite co costly, but there's an absolute benefit as well. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a straightforward, just get full-time, it's not a straightforward use contract, but which areas can we afford to go full-time versus which areas do we need to work better with our contract specialists? So I think these were some of the use um, cases from the benchmarking data. Um, and there's so many more that we've had conversations at the executive team level, but also at the board level. And I think we continue to have these conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Elikem. Great to hear. So Edward team, any comments on, on this? How else we can use the data and what's the use of this data on the day-to-day -day activity? What's the impact? Tim, do you want to, to comment a little bit be before we move uh, to your question? <laughs> because sure. the next question will be actually to you. Sure. Th thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, I mean, th these are fascinating data and the whole concept of benchmarking, um, you know, I, in, in my mind, very simplistically, it, it comes down to two different uh, broad categories. You know, one can, I noticed in the, in the chat, you know, someone was asking, well, can we use internal benchmarking? And the answer to that is, you know, of course, you can always, you know, choose something that you wish to improve and you can look at how you've been doing and, you know, with uh, effort and concentration, you can find ways to improve it. But I think, uh, Echoing Dr. Lutz's comments, one of the really important things about benchmarking externally is to help in strategic decision making about, well, what am I going to improve? Uh, you know, just to say we're going to get better is, is, you know, not always possible to make everything better. And there's so many things one can measure. So choosing key metrics and, and growing to learn how you can trust them and then looking across other organizations can really be helpful as you make decisions about where you're going to spend your valuable resources to improve. And uh, you know, certainly if you have something that you know, is someone's very favorite thing to improve, but you're always already doing very well in that area, um, as a very simple decision, you might choose to look elsewhere for where you're gonna deploy your resources. And, and then I think you know, just the data may 
shine a light on some areas that you need to improve. But then, of course, beneath that are other very important and complex aspects of strategic thinking. You know, do we know how to improve that metric? Uh, is this, you know, which one will take more effort to improve? Uh, things of this nature. So, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's very difficult to be sustainably improving as an organization without having some insight into what others are doing. And, and it gives you an opportunity to learn not only how you're doing, but then hopefully through forums like this or other relationships, one can, you know, address them and say, you know, tell us a little bit about how you're doing there. What, what can we learn from you? So thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim. So basically, if we use medical language, medical terminology, benchmarking is the diagnostic tool which helps you to identify the area which requires treatment. Uh, treatment means improvement. Uh, so the next question is actually uh, to Tim. And uh, how can IFC uh, lessons from the IFC exercise and the results of IFC exercise, how they correlate uh, and how much they differ from what Mayo Clinic is doing uh, in the area of benchmarking? Interesting to know. Yeah, so thank you again. Um, I, I was really fortunate to um, have some interactions with the IFC team uh, you know, during the formulation of the project because we at Mayo Clinic have been uh, developing some relationships with other organizations internationally. Um, and all of them and us together have a desire to both be able to evaluate the quality of services being provided and then hopefully provide uh, assistance to improve or learn from them how we can improve. And so we had started a project uh, a little less ambitious than what IFC started because ours was very focused on quality as just a small component of Mayo's uh, leadership had decided to do this. And we ran into many of the same uh, obstacles that were already mentioned by Emmett. Um, you know, it's very challenging. Not everyone is measuring the same thing uh, that, you know, just, just like you found, uh, we had been asking for quality measure reporting from some of our associations for some time. And we found many times those numbers were not reported or they were reported with a different dimension. And it was clear that they were different definitions. Um, Simple things like, you know, what's an inpatient, what's an outpatient, what, what actually defines a hospital day, um, patient experience, not everyone measures the same thing using the same instruments amongst the same populations. Uh, things like denominators and, and numerators become very important. So these definitions that were mentioned. Uh, and then another, you know, very important issue is uh, the relationship between what care is actually being provided and what gets documented. And that then translates into how can someone who wants to know the quality of services find out the quality of services? And as you think through the ramifications of that, how much resource does a given organization have to devote to measuring and reporting? And so after all of that, I, you know, it's not entirely surprising to me, knowing what we've gone through, to see the large number of organizations that either reported nothing or reported values that make one you know, think about, can that really be true? Uh, you know, we, we've seen areas where uh, they have no pneumonia mortalities and that, you know, that would be unusual, I think. Um, and, and I think like you, we've seen that organizations that tend to report more, it, they often are culturally more mature and uh, technically more mature in their data gathering efforts. So uh, the interpretation of that data, you know, needs to be sort of viewed through that lens to say, just because I'm seeing more infections at hospital A doesn't mean that hospital A actually has more infections. It very likely has to do with how carefully they're looking for those infections. Um, but that makes, it creates a lot of challenges. Uh, the, the last thing I would say is, uh, you know, much of this also has to do with uh, some transparency issues. Different hospitals have different cultures about their level of transparency, both internally and within a country. And so that can also create challenges. So, you know, I think that what you reported is, is fascinating. It's a, a more organizations than we're working with, but it's very similar to the types of things that we've been finding. Thanks, thanks a lot, Tim. So transparency is super important in whatever you are doing, what, uh, uh, whether it relates to efficiency, whether it relates to quality, we keep repeating it. So thanks a lot, Tim, for drawing the audience attention to this fact. Encourage transparency and encourage openness culture. This will help you in whatever area you need to improve. This is number one. And data interpretation requires a lot of attention. This is something we've been repeating all over 
again during the previous webinars which re related to measurements. This is so true. Make sure you interpret your data in the right way. Only then you can properly diagnose the areas that require attention. Before we move to the next question with our panelists, I wanted to make one technical comment. We receive multiple questions, both in question and answer section and in chat. We see all of them and we have our normal question and answer session as always, as uh, during our previous webinars shortly after we end the panel discussion. So please do not worry. We see all the questions and we're not ignoring you. So now we move to the next question. And actually, it's a question to the IFC team that participated uh, and developed the project and participated uh, in uh, the uh, rollout of this, uh, this benchmarking uh, project. Uh, specifically, uh, we wanted to hear opinion of Raju, and then Charles and Emmett can comment. Were there any surprises? Any surprises which related to the findings or any, any other to data that you received? Curious to know that. Uh, thank, thank you, Julia. I, I wouldn't call it surprises, but more uh, an eye-opening kind of an observation because we, we knew that the water is deep, but I think what was interesting was uh, the depth, uh, you know, the, the, the level of depth was, was more, more interesting to know because uh, even to start with, even when we started collecting data during initial consultation, the surprises was creation of definitions, as Emmett mentioned. You know, it's simple indicators, but to different people, it means different things. So I think that standardization itself was quite a uh, mammoth task for us. So that that's one one surprise I would say. The, the other one which stays in my mind is again, I think uh, Emmett alluded to that was the, the daycare cases. We knew that. Uh, in, in the emerging markets, uh, daycare utilization is, is lower, but what kind of surprise is that the, the gap between uh, matured market and emerging market? That was quite significant. I, I wouldn't have guessed it that it is that big a variation, but I think that that, that was one, one interesting find. The other one, which uh, before I pass it to Charles, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a physician engagement model, as uh, Dr. Lincoln mentioned, you know, full-time versus part-time visiting consultants. Um, I would have thought that one is definitely better than the other, but there is no direct correlation. There's many other factors that, that affect that, that dynamic. So uh, depending on your operating market and uh, many other factors do affect it. So that, that was another, another interesting observation, which I, I personally found it very, very useful. And over to you, Charles. Yeah, I don't think there were any, there were no major surprises. I think what it did for me, it confirmed maybe what I was thinking, but hadn't dug deep enough to confirm that. So again, Raju sort of alluded to that. I, I think from my perspective, I was, it, the day case one didn't surprise me because I could see that in, in, in some markets, because of the level of clinical sophistication and preparedness for day surgery, people's ability to pay, the insurance entities don't sometimes know how to pay for day case work. So again, that sort of con confirmed that. The, the clinical model, yeah, that it wasn't a surprise, but it was a confirmation and really led me to uh, trying to understand, the, want to know more about the underlying reasons. And I think it, it highlighted to me the problem that we've got. And Emmett touched on that in his presentation, that the, 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 the access to clinicians, this global shortage. And as we go into less mature markets, the, the, the challenge becomes, becomes higher, particularly the level of specialization, which then has an impact on what services you can provide i.e. the day cases and other, other levels of specialization, which then confirmed to me that you need to know the country, you need to know the market, you need to know what type of business you're going to be operating in the short with targeting to the long-term growth because of all of these variable factors. So, so thank you. Thanks a lot, Raju. Thanks a lot, Charles. So next question is to Emmett. Uh, what quality data can tell us? <laughs> so that's a good question, Julia. So, well, I, th I think a few things. So the first, like I said, is, you know, that m many, many organizations are not collecting um, as, much as, as much quality data as we thought they might. And it goes back to, you know, my statement at the beginning that quite often, you know, the, the, the mission of a hospital is quality is the heart of everything we do or, or stuff like that. But, when we collect the data, there, there's a lot less of it. So, 
you know, it, it makes us wonder what, what, what is being, what is being collected. Um, another thing is, is exactly as, as Tim mentioned, and I saw it in one of the Q and A as well that came up, which was around patient satisfaction. We, we did collect data on patient satisfaction. What, one of the, one of the reasons I didn't present it is that it's so all over the place, um, you know, and, I guess no real surprise because uh, I, you know, I know myself, and I, I know that you will know Julie as well, that uh, different organisations just collect it so many, so many different ways. Um, and, and the third thing is, you know, how how do we how do we interpret this? And again, and again, T Tim alluded to this is, you know, if a hospital appears to have high mortality or high infection rates or high incidents. Are those really the worst performing, or 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 is it the opposite? Are they actually the best, because they're 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 capturing the data so accurately? Um, you know, so I you know I, my my own career started in a teaching hospital in London, Imperial, and you know I'm pretty sure, although we didn't measure it at the time, that we had the worst mortality for you know, cardiac operations, the worst mortality in our trauma center, the worst mortality for, for cancer, because we got all the cases that were not done by, by other hospitals. So I think there's an element in the data there too. So I guess maybe my, my, uh, my overall answer to your, to your question is that may, maybe we've generated more questions than answers. Um, and may, may, maybe this is the start of a journey uh, rather than the end of one, you know, what, what I would like to see maybe as, and we've talked about this, you know, taking it forward is that, you know, maybe we have a quality group as part of the benchmarking group, uh, where we discuss these data and what it means. And we share it more openly across, across the, the different companies tr to try to make sense of it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Emmett. Actually, we are running a little bit out of time because we are getting so many questions. Uh, and uh, so I will not comment much on this, but speaking about uh, whether it's a start of the journey or at the end of the journey, next question is to Charles. How is IFC going to move this uh, service forward? And what was the feedback from the participants? Yeah, I'll keep this short. Um, so basically very positive. So the feedback we've got is everybody, the majority of people that participated really enjoyed it. We would like to do it again. We're currently trying to figure out how we can do it again and how to structure it. Because you can see the learning for us has been considerable. And there's lots of different areas where we can drill down. We're also potentially looking at, you know, maybe we could supplement it with, with sort of performance enhancement initiatives or can we drill down into these specific areas? Can we create learning groups about particular topics? And we're, we're very happy to discuss. So we've, we've completed what I would call the pilot of phase one. We now want to do phase two. So we're very open to ideas and suggestions. We will be talking to the 18 entities that participated, but we're also good to, it'll be good to hear questions, um, ideas from others as, as well. So we are committed to do it again. We just want to shape it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Charles. Thanks. Uh, so I think uh, uh, now we can move uh, to the last question. Uh, so basically benchmarking is done once. What are the next opportunities? What should be the next steps for the hospitals? We a little bit covered the, uh, this uh, in our previous discussions today, but still question to our uh, panelists who represent hospitals. So what should be the next steps once you participated in the benchmarking exercise? What to do next? Uh, I think maybe Tim can start and then uh, Dr. Ellie Kim uh, and Edward. Sure, thanks. Um, you know, I, I think for those whose appetite has been wet for benchmarking, um, it should be very clear that one of the most helpful things would be if we could all converge on the definitions of the quality metrics, you know, in, in some ways, it's not surprising that the financial metrics are more available and more reported because financial accounting systems have been largely standardized over, you know, a hundred years or more, where quality measurement is, is still, you know, somewhat early in its journey, but standardization of metrics would be a key first step so that we would begin to gain more confidence over what's being reported. I'll, I'm sure others have other comments. Thanks a lot, Tim. Dr. Elikem, uh, any, any uh, advice uh, from you? What should be the next steps? 
Yeah, no, I think, um, and we were really um, appreciative of being part of this group because um, benchmarking, we've done benchmarking in other areas. So for example, salary um, benchmarking is quite common. However, it's not common in the African or in Ghana, it's not very common. So what we saw as a challenge was the transparency, people willing to enter into a program where they could share their data. Um, that was actually very difficult. And so um, when it came to something that was similar to this, we were very interested because we wanted to learn. So I think that remaining a learning organization requires us to first be transparent um, and authentic with ourselves. Where do we need to improve? Sometimes it's actually, do we have quality systems? Have we invested enough in the measurement aspect to do it and to do it well? I think that's a good question for any hospital that's looking at this. Um, and then the second is um, beyond the benchmarking, what other data sets can we get to make um, a, a better assumption? Um, it's still going to be an assumption until we actually um, get the um, benefit of hindsight. But I think when it comes to decision-making, opening up the data sets to multiple areas will be helpful. Thanks a lot, Dr. Elikem. Edward, what's your opinion on, the, on this? Thank you, thank you, Julia. I think, um, firstly, it's very valuable. And I think one of the things that will add for us further value is a little bit potentially, if it's possible to have more granularity in the data sets. There is already a suggestion that, that stage of the hospital's maturity has got an impact on the metrics. If there is any way of presenting or grouping doctors the hospitals in in where within certain buckets of maturity that will be helpful because then then it helps you our organization for example um, in another country that i worked they benchmarked all the hospitals based on size because there was a very clear correlation between size of hospital and um, your metrics so it was less than 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 50, is it? So I think that is also potential, that kind of granularity if it's possible. The other aspect that is helpful, and um, you've, you've, you've um, 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 touched on it, is the aspect of learning from the best practice in other hospitals. And, and it was mentioned staff turnover rate. If, if, if I or if we could have site of a case study or a paper from that hospital can be shared confidentially. What are they doing to have, and what is these initiatives that they take to have a low um, 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 uh, uh, staff turnover? The other element, for example, was incident reporting. Um, what do the, um, I wouldn't say best in class organization, but the one that you have observed as best practice, what are they doing? So that we can learn within the parameters, what does good look like and how can we um, get to, to, to that particular. So and that is the learning at the moment. Yes, we've got it and we can learn in our internal, but very much part of our, our benchmarking is how do others get it right? Thank you, Julia. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Edward. And actually speaking about incident reporting, it's one of the most common questions of all times. Is it good to have many incidents or few incidents? Is it the criteria of good work, safe work, or not so not such safe work? Same with infections, actually. Yeah. So this was already covered during the previous discussions. So on this, uh, we pause, we stop our panel discussion and move to our uh, question and answer session. And uh, we, as I already said, received so many questions today. Probably we will not be able to answer all of them due to the time restrictions, but we'll definitely cover uh, most of the questions in our community of practice on Facebook, which we normally do. So please, uh, you're welcome to join. And uh, if you ask a question and don't get an answer today, you, you will be able to get this answer in our community of practice. And the first question is actually a tricky question because it was already raised several times and our audience just keep asking about it. That is standardization 
and uh, the indicators, how to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples. And the question, uh, the reason why I'm asking this question is actually, I think many hospitals who did not participate in benchmarking before might start thinking, okay, I want to measure, I want to collect data, and then also benchmark myself to someone. So how to make sure they do it right from the very beginning? Any advice, any tips where they can look for definitions, et cetera, so that the work they do previously before the benchmark is not in vain, that they can use their indicators to compare themselves to others. Uh, who would like to be the first to answer this question? I'm looking for volunteers. I will not be pointing. <laughs> okay, Tim, you're welcome. Thanks. Yes, thanks. So uh, I'd mentioned, you know, we, we've kind of engaged in this work actually a couple of years ago, and uh, we immediately ran into all the barriers that we've, we've been discussing. And so what we've been doing at Mayo Clinic uh, as an organization with our Mayo Clinic Care Network members internationally is we've engaged in a collaboration to begin to choose a limited set of metrics that at least cover, you know, many of the domains of quality, uh, safety, experience, and so forth and then trying to converge on definitions that people can uh, use and can report on and you know, keeping in mind all the different constraints and transparency and everything. And we're making some progress, but it is hard work. So you know, I, I think um, you know, to the extent, I'm, I'm repeating a bit, but to the extent that there could be a convergence towards common metrics um, and a secure environment so people you know begin to feel more comfortable with we're reporting into some database you know can we receive the benchmark anonymized who has control over that i think that's going to be really valuable and that act obviously takes a lot of organization and work thank you very much emmet do you want to to comment on this because you are definitely an expert <laughs> after all all the work that you did with the project so well, any yeah. any advice uh, how to make sure that what you measure can then be compared. Maybe it's a journey rather than a destination. Uh, so maybe, 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 I'll, uh, maybe I'll combine two, two questions in, in, into one answer. So regarding the, the surprises that came out of this, I, I guess one surprise uh, was that we were able to do this at all. Um, you know, and the reason I say that is that during our consultation, a lot of people said, no, it's, it's impossible. You know, it's impossible to compare apples with apples. You know, if you just think about all these countries and companies and what they're doing. Uh, so the, the, fact, the fact that, you know, maybe we're not comparing apples with apples if we're 100% honest, but I, th I think we're at least comparing fruit with fruit. And, you know, we're not, I don't think the exercise was ever aimed at trying to get like everything 100% correct. You know, like, I don't think we, we ever, you know, that was never what it was about. You know, it was about, you know, is, is the data accurate enough that we can make a meaningful judgment here about where to look in our hospital for areas of performance? I think that's what it's about. Uh, now, a big mistake anyone would make would be to take this data and say, oh, we have a problem in our operating room because we're inefficient there, or we have a problem in our lab. You know, what it does is it shows you where there may be a problem. You know, let's look, is there a reasonable explanation? If there's a reasonable explanation, move on. Um, so I, I know that's not directly answering the question about it. So we, we, have to, we have to keep in mind when we're talking about the data about why, why we're actually collecting it. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, standardizing, you know, Tim is absolutely right that, you know, financial data is relatively standardized. Similarly for the day cases, you know, we use the ICD-10 codes, which are also relatively standardized. The, where, where it became tricky was in the operations. Uh, I don't think there's any go-to uh, definitions for a lot of these things. Uh, we, ha we had to develop them in consultation with the group. The hardest area of all, um, and again, Tim talked about the reasons for this, was around the quality. Um, you know, th there are just a lot of different ways of, of, you know, like what is an incident, for example, it's measured, it can be measured in a very different way, or even what is an infection, uh, or what is a fall, which was another area we looked at. 
Um, so, you know, I guess if I look back at my previous experience, which was in big consulting firm, um, you know, we, we, we formed a group and as, as we moved forward year by year, we, 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 we modified these um, definitions as we moved on as, as a collective and, and as a group. Yeah, that, that's my experience. Thank you very much, Amit. Uh, that was useful. Charles, you have your hand up. Yeah, just a very quick point, and, and, and Tim touched on it, and there is a question in the chat, and it sort of links to this, is, is really what you can be doing in advance of doing benchmarks, so the, the internal, and a key th learning for me is, is variance analysis. And I learned this very early on in my career, like at Emmet, I came out of the NHS finance and the management track. And we, I spent a lot of my early years doing variance analysis where I would sit with the clinical heads, the nurse heads to understand what are the drivers of performance that are impacting on the way the hospital performs from a cost perspective, but from a performance perspective. And if you've got your heads around variance analysis, what's driving average length of stay in a particular month, you're automatically building up your ability to understand benchmarking. So you're already tracking certain indicators. So that's a very good starting point to, to be able to go into this benchmarking is to, is to look at so, some form of variance analysis across your organization and keep a record of trends and then understand what is driving those trends because that, uh, that allows you to get your head around and understand what benchmarking can offer you. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Great point, Raju. Yeah, I think for, for organizations that are, you know, wanting to get into this, this benchmarking, well, one key uh, advice which, which, which I have is that you shouldn't hyper-focus on just one set of indicators because you've you got, you got to look, there are a lot of interdependencies, right? So you, you can't just look at operational indicator alone or financial indicators in, in isolation. In the dependencies, so my my take when I, when I used to do this in my previous organizations is that we look at four buckets. You, you look at your a set of clinical indicators, something very similar to what you have done: clinical, operational, financial, and and service, because all these are uh, intended and, and very important. And this alludes to one of the questions in, in the chat. You know, how do you uh, what is why why don't you measure or how do you measure patient satisfaction and patient experience? I think that that's a very important indicator eventually when when we get to that because end of the day all this is about about the patient right we are doing all this to give the patient a good experience and 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 to have a patient engagement and satisfaction. Uh, a very quick example is that in the past when 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 we measured organizations in terms of their uh, utilization of equipment, for example, we, we had two organizations, one of them, and we took at the X-ray machine utilization. One of them are very highly utilized. The other one utilization was relatively lower. But when we look at the patient satisfaction of these two hospitals, it was the other way around. It's, this hospital with the very high utilization, they just only had one X-ray machine centralized, so very highly utilized. But of course, patients were in very happy because there's longer waiting time and you know, patient needs to go to the machine. Whereas the other hospital, they had three machines, two in the diagnostic imaging, one in the health screening. So decentralized, the patient need not travel around from one point of the hospital to the other end. So the patients were very highly satisfied and the experience was much better. That's what I mean by interdependencies. So we got to strike a balance between your operational efficiency versus patient experience versus your financial indicators. So I think that is something to keep in mind. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Raju. And the next question actually came several times from different uh, sources. Uh, and uh, it's, again, patient satisfaction. And Emmett uh, a little bit touched on this, but I also wanted to ask Tim <laughs> about uh, what is the advice regarding patient satisfaction, how to benchmark it, how to measure it. Is NPS uh, of any use? Uh, so just generally what you would recommend, because this is obviously a big part of each hospital's activity to measure patient experience, to assess patient satisfaction. So how to do it properly and how to compare yourself to others in this area? Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm going to have to dodge it a bit because I, I, I've really, what we've encountered as we've looked at this is you know, one organization, let, let's say you have two different organizations who both actually ask all of their inpatients in some statistical sampling satisfaction. One organization may use a four-point Likert scale. Another organization may use a five-point Likert scale. Um, and if you go yet to a third organization, maybe they're only sampling 
day cases. And so, you know, if, if one just takes the reports and says, well, here's the comparisons, uh, it, it's not going to be very useful. Uh, one of the things that we're ex toying with at this point, at, at least in, in uh, hospitals that sample their entire uh, inpatient population, perhaps we can non-dimensionalize the answers and, and so have a you know, percent of maximum or something like this. But I think this is at its infancy. Um, what, where we're kind of coming out right now is uh, very much a process measure. Do you sample patient satisfaction and what percent uh, of your inpatients? And that's a start. So, it, I, you know, as Emmett's already said, it's, it's a journey and it's the destination is a ways off. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Edward, uh, and what about your hospital? Uh, how do you manage it? And how, how, what do you do about patient experience generally? How do you learn about it? Patient experience is notoriously difficult to, to manage. So, so we look at it more like a cube from different angles. We look at, we've got our surveys in place and we look at it on a, on a regular basis. We also look at other angles, patient complaints. Then we also look at our complements. Then we also fold this in with our daily operational quality rounds and what the patients get back. Then we also look at, strangely enough, Google reviews. <laughs> and we look at our number of positive feedback and negative feedback, likes and dislikes. So we have got a, all of these sources comes into one. And from a structure, we have formed what we call a patient experience council. And all of these data gets then um, um, looked at uh, aggregately on a, a monthly basis. But on a daily basis, we look at our um, patient feedback in our, our morning clinical huddles. Um, and I think um, because it's so difficult and, you, and we're so laser focused on patient experience, just a survey form, whether it's a long form, a short form, whatever form, you, 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 uh, that is not really so relevant. As long as you measure patient experience, and you're not only looking at patient satisfaction, you have to look at the entire spectrum of data points, data sources that's out there to, to, to form a, 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 a very nice color or picture of what is your, what, 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 how do you, your patients experience your service? Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much, Edward. And uh, Dr. Elikam. So maybe a couple of sentences from you and your experience uh, and just generally your attitude, maybe some advice you can give, yes. Well, yeah, I'll be very quick because I think um, actually the, a lot of the things I quite agree with um, Tim and um, Edward because I think all of the limitations of net promoter score um, or patients, I mean, the quantitative is not enough. I think that um, social media has changed in terms of how people give feedback and, and honest feedback. I think the qualitative aspect of it is really where um, it, that's what makes it complex because every society is slightly different. What we saw is that our numbers are not as sensitive because we live in a community and Ghana is very, um, we call it very, it's like a, one, one big village in that um, there are different networks and the networks are very interrelated. So if you have one negative feedback, it can actually magnify because of a network effect. So the sensitivity is really important as compared to another jurisdiction where people live more separate lives. So we tend to take qualitative um, and interviews and, and we try and get a bit more um, around that, but it's very hard um, because you do need to bring everything together um, for the system, how to do that and across different sites um, is not gonna be the same solutions. So that makes it complex, but we're still working at it. I don't have necessarily anything specific beyond that. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dr. Elikan. Very, very important input. Uh, so next question, actually, more again, like kind of requesting advice question. Uh, so basically, uh, I see that the audience is interested uh, how to make it practical, how to make it work. They, I, I think they are already eager to benchmark themselves. So uh, what advice can you give to a hospital? Uh, on the one hand, it's obvious, yeah, to join some benchmarking club. 
But maybe there are some other ways. Maybe they can start benchmarking uh, by themselves. And here, the first question usually is adjustment of data. Yeah, because there are bigger hospitals, there are smaller hospitals that publish their data. There are complex cases, complex patients that hospital is taking, and there are just more like primary care facilities or something like that. So how to adjust data that is publicly available and how to adjust your own data? What tips, what advice you can give? Tim, yes, please. Yes, thanks. So, um, you know, this, this aspect of how are we going to compare our data with someone else, um, as has already been raised, you know, one, one step towards that is what we would call cohorting. So, you know, can we compare facilities that provide similar services or are, you know, operating in a similar environment? Um, you know, cohorting is, is valuable, not always completely, um, you know, reliable in terms of uh, normalizing the, the denominator, because as was pointed out, you could have two small hospitals. One might be a specialty hospital, a very narrow focus and very high uh, sophistication, and the other might be a smaller hospital that's very general and, and doesn't have specialists. So, so comparing uh, those two by, let's say, bed size would, would maybe not be all that helpful. But cohorting is, I think, a first and probably easiest step to take is to look for the parameters of another facility. This, the second you know, way that this is you know, pursued is through risk adjustment. So in other words, not only measure infection rates, but infection rates in patients like that patient, which are done through statistical adjustments. And those are very heavily dependent on the richness of the data available to those who are trying to do these adjustments. So there you have uh, challenges of the gap between I'm, I'm delivering care, what's documented, is it documented in a way that the uh, measurers can obtain it and then enter it into the adjustment models. But I think your first step is probably cohorting. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, so anyone else wants to, to comment? Edward, maybe you want to comment on this? Yeah, I'd I'd, um, I'd echo that, Doctor um, Tim's to to um, in terms of cohorting, um, try and identify organizations similar to you. But then again, um, yeah, the the sense of openness and transparency in sharing the data. Um, and sometimes when you work in a smaller country, um, it's not maybe so easy to identify. And it is just just not not that available. So you have to go. Um, um, regional with with that, um, and I think the other aspect that is it always starts with the small steps um, is to have this sense of inquisitors, uh, 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 culture and mindset of if you look or see anything, this is interesting. Why is this like this? And just to start off in bit that in your your all of your clinical body, your administration. This is very interesting. Why is it like that? And there afterwards, that usually kickstart a, a hunger for data, a hunger for an analytics, a hunger for um, looking um, in, in areas where you never thought that you would um, look at. So thank you, Julia. Thanks, yeah. thanks a lot, Edward. Maybe Charles, can... you have your hand up. Yeah, just very quickly. I mean, I, I think this poses a question for us as IFC, how we could potentially use this exercise talking to the 18 entities and maybe to come up with a guide just to say, how do you start? What data do you need to be getting your heads around before you come into this? How do you analyze it? What you should be collecting? What you should what should you be expecting if you start comparing yourselves to others? And I think that's a question for us as well, how we can use this process to help guide others. Thanks. That's for sure, Charles. Yeah, and actually, we have uh, we are running out of time, really. But uh, one more question we wanted, uh, I wanted to take, and uh, maybe ask Emmet and Charles and Raju to comment on this. Uh, it's it's a question relating to the future of this exercise. Uh, so, uh, is IFC planning to extend it? Uh, can other hospitals join it? Uh, and what what would be the next step? We a little bit covered that at the beginning, but it uh, this question still keeps coming through questions and answer sessions. So I thought 
let's let's address this. And also, will there be any how to get access to this benchmarking data that IUC has basically? Uh, so Emmett, maybe you can start and then Charles and Raju can comment on this as well. Thanks. Uh, this uh, will be our last question. <laughs> uh, sure, I'm happy to start and uh, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Charles and Raju uh, f f finish up. Uh, so, so I guess on, on the data itself and how people can access it, there's only one way to access it, and that is as, as a member of, of the group. Uh, so one of the conditions uh, that more, more than half of the, the joining members um, made when they joined was confidentiality of, of the data. Uh, so, so that's why we're, we're very protective of it. And we've only shared this very general high level data on a totally anonymized um, basis. Uh, so there's, that, that's why there's nothing about the geography or the size of the hospitals or anything shown in, in, in the charts. Uh, so that, that's the only way to, to, um, to access it. Um, regarding the, the future of the service, we, we're, now, we're now in the process um, of, of getting feedback from, from everyone who joined. We're well, well into that now and taking a decision on how to take the, the service forward and you know, like whether it should be every one year or every two years and what we focus on and how we move it forward and so on. Um, and I, I, would, I would suggest, and Charles, Raji, please, um, you, know, you, you can, you can um, clarify this, but I would suggest that anyone on the call now who is interested in joining in, in the future that, that, they, uh, that they email you know, the organizer or perhaps, perhaps Charles, Charles, you can, you can say who, uh, to, to, to express your interest um, in, in joining in future and, uh, and, what, and, and, and your reason for it and, and, and motivation and so on and how, how you would like to shape it. That, that's what I would suggest. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmett. Charles? Yeah, just quickly, I, I agree with everything Emmett says. So please, yeah, as I said earlier, we are looking, we're going to figure out how we can do it, how we can expand it, how we can supplement it. But please feel free to contact us if you are in interest, and then we'll make sure that you get further information as, as, as we, we go. So that's all I've got to really say on that. So I'll hand over to Raju if he's got any thoughts on how we can expand. No, Thanks. <laughs> uh, no absolutely. As, as Emmett mentioned, this is a journey. This is not a, a destination. So more people are, are always welcome to join the club in, in the future because then we can do, as Tim mentioned, very meaningful cohorting because when we have more members and we can group them in, into uh, meaningful cohorts, it be very useful. So please feel free to reach out and we would be more than happy to you know, continue this as long as there is an interest and, and demand from, from the members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajam. So yes, thanks a lot to all our panelists. Uh, thanks a lot to our audience. We will be wrapping up now. We believe it was useful. We hope it was useful exercise for you. And it was interesting discussion that maybe inspired you to compare yourselves to others and to start the benchmarking journey soon. So uh, please share your emails in the chat and also we can share Charles' email if you are interested to participate in such exercise. You're welcome. Please contact us. Uh, so once again, thanks a lot uh, to all our guest panelists, uh, to team, to Edward, to Dr. Elikem. Thanks a lot to IFC team, uh, Charles, Raju and Emmett. And we hope to see you on our next webinar. Uh, we will announce the subject of uh, our next webinar separately as usual. So thanks a lot. And thanks a lot to the audience for staying a little bit longer today. We really appreciate that. And we already, by the way, get a lot of positive feedback uh, through chat, which is great that you like the subject, that you like the discussion. So hope to see you next time. Uh, Natasha, do you want to make any, any comment now? Yes, I do, of course. I'd like to ask you to please provide your feedback when you exit the webinar. Please let us know what we did well, what else you would like to know, what was not so interesting, because this is what we use to make our webinars useful for you. And this is the reason why we are holding those webinars. And uh, thank you very much to all of the speakers for joining us today. Thanks a lot. And definitely we will be posting answers to some of the questions uh, in our community of practice. That's for sure, because we didn't have enough time for all of them. But you're welcome to read them in our community of practice on Facebook. The link is shared in the chat. And thanks a lot. Uh, have a great evening. Have a great afternoon today. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.